put it back up. So, um, so uh, we can, um, you know, come back together as a room and, and answer any questions you guys have. All right, well, this is me, or it was 100 pounds ago. I had gastric bypass <laughs> surgery in October, and um, I've, I, I, as of Friday, I've been, I'm down 100 pounds. So Yay. Um, that was me <laughs> last fall. Um, I uh, got my Master of Arts in Clinical Mental Health Counseling um, from Regis in 2020. Um, I, this is a second career for me. Um, I'd always wanted to be a mental health counselor, and um, I had a first uh, career in private wealth management. And then at 50, I decided I finally figured out what I wanted to do uh, for a living. <laughs> so I, uh, I went back to school. I got my bachelor's degree in applied psychology and then my uh, master's in clinical mental health counseling. Um, I'm in private practice I, in North Glen. I specialize in grief, loss, and life transitions, which of course includes um, both um, end of life planning, um, serious illness, um, dementia care, um, caregiving for elderly parents, uh, that sort of thing. I joined COCA um, last fall um, in September. And um, I've been working with Caitlin in the grief, um, the supportive services department. And I have been working uh, with True Community Care Hospice as a volunteer since 2016. I started out in patient care. And then um, when they found out that I was in school to be a grief counselor, they moved me over to grief services. And I still volunteer for them on a regular basis doing grief support groups. Um, I also did my internship there at True in the Grief Services Center. So um, I, uh, I consider myself a death educator. Um, I, I host death cafes, and um, so it's just kind of a forum to people for people to talk about death and dying because it is such a taboo subject in our society. So I try to make it more um, more comfortable uh, to ask questions and talk and have those conversations with people that you love. And so sometimes people wonder what the difference is between palliative care and hospice care. And um, there's a, this uh, graphic shows the intersection. Um, palliative care and hospice care both focus on optimizing comfort, reducing stress, providing emotional and su spiritual support to not only the person who's um, in hospice, but also their families. And then also uh, symptom management. Um, palliative care, however, can rece be received at any stage of disease and it can occur simultaneously with curative treatments such as chemo and radiation. Um, hospice care tends to be when somebody has a prognosis of six months or less to live. And um, it's not, most curative treatments um, are not done simultaneously. So this is kind of when you decide, have decided enough is enough. And um, I'm gonna let nature take its course. Um, so that's when, um, it's time. And so this is who's eligible. Um, so patients are eligible when you have a doctor who's diagnosed you with a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less. And so at that time, the decision has been made that um, curative care is going to stop and symptom management becomes the primary focus. Um, and it's either at the patient's option or choice. Um, this isn't something that's ever foisted upon you. So hospice is always a choice. And um, so I promised, uh, as promised, um, I would talk a little bit about what hospice care is and what it is not. Um, what it is, is very life affirming. Um, their goal in hospice is to help you live as fully as possible for as long as possible. And the focus is on quality of life and comfort. Um, they want you to have whatever you want to do in, in whatever life you have left. And it's not only support for the patients, but it's also a great deal of support for caregivers. It also opens up an incredible access to resources. Um, and we'll talk more about what resources are added um, when you add hospice care to your care team. Um, and also, uh, this is where a lot of the myths start coming in, is, is hospice is always a patient choice. You can leave hospice and return to curative care anytime you want. 
Um, and you get to choose which hospice services and resources you want to receive and take advantage of. And this evolves as your needs change. You can just say, well, I want to take advantage of the social work, you know, and chaplain portions in the beginning. And then, you know, as it moves into pain management and then volunteers and respite care and all that. So you get to pick and choose. There's a menu of options that are available and you get to decide how you'd like to do that. And the focus is always on how you want to spend what time you have left. If you want to travel, um, they will try to make that happen. They will try to get you as comfortable as possible and put the resources in place so that you can do that. They want you to reach whatever goals you have. Um, if you need to do end of life planning, if you want to have visits with people, if you want to complete a legacy project, um, hospice helps out with all of that sort of thing. And this is what hospice care isn't. Um, hospice care isn't giving up. It's just a shift in focus from curative to comfort care and symptom management. And I love this uh, meme. It's a little hard to read on the screen, but it says there's a difference between giving up and knowing when you've had enough. And that's kind of the point where um, hospice kind of comes in. When you say, I've had enough chemo, I've had enough surgeries, I've had enough um, of all of this. I just want to live out the, whatever life I have left as comfortably and as fully as possible. Hospice is not also just waiting to die. Um, it's the goal is always to live life as fully as you, as you can for as long as you can. Um, it's also not hastening death. Um, early intervention, if you get into hospice early enough, can actually increase the quantity as well as the quality of life. Um, when you're comfortable and when you are pain-free, you tend to live longer. And so if you get hospice involved earlier than you have, you studies have shown that it's actually increases survival for certain diagnosis. And it's also not only for the last days of life. Um, the maximum benefit is achieved if you take advantage of it earlier rather than later. I know people always you know, have this idea of when you go into hospice, you're within days of death. And that's not always the case. Although, you know, and that's mostly because people just wait too long to take advantage. So here's some common hospice myths. Um, again, um, hospice means giving up on living. And, um, oh, here's the statistic. Um, people enrolled in hospice actually live on average about a month longer than people who are not on hospice. Um, another myth is to get hospice care, you have to leave your home and go into some kind of facility and that you can't work with your doctor anymore. That's absolutely not the case. Hospice isn't a place, it's a service. And almost 70% of hospice patients actually receive those services in their own home. And if it's um, uh, the patient's goal to die in their own home, hospice will absolutely try to make that happen. Another myth is that hospice care is expensive and you won't be able to afford it. And in fact, it's often available at little or no cost to the patient. Um, hospice is a benefit covered under Medicare and most private insurance companies. So in most cases, hospice care is completely covered, even when you go off and go back on. Um, it's also the myth that that's just for people with cancer. That's not true. Um, it, in fact, a lot of elderly people, um, you know, who are within six months of the end of the life enter that, you know, just to give their caregivers a break and make sure that there any symptoms that they have are managed well. Um, another myth is that all hospice providers are pretty much the same, and that is definitely not the case. Um, all hospice providers are independent. Um, they can be certified or not certified. They can be credentialed. They can be profit or nonprofit. They can be affiliated with a hospital. Um, there are religious hospice services. There are secular hospice services, um, and they provide a wide range of service. So when you're going to select a hospice, um, Keep in you know, mind what you want out of hospice and interview them and see if they offer that. And um, another huge myth is that when it's time for hospice, your doctor will recommend it. And that is so sadly not the case. Um, most doctors um, consider the end of life um, something to be avoided at all costs instead of the natural end of a, of a lifetime. And um, they just want to keep throwing stuff at it. Um, so a lot of times the doctors wait for the patient or their families to bring up hospice. And that's what leads to our late enrollments. And most people that I've worked with say, oh, I wish we would have um, come sooner because this would have been wonderful to have a lot earlier. 
So when you bring hospice into your care team, and again, I want to reiterate that into your care team, you still get your doctors, you still have um, everybody that you've always worked with. Hospice is an addition to your care team, not instead of. Um, so the leader of your hospice team will be the hospice physician. Um, and they are the ones that closely monitor everything. Um, they review all the records. They're the ones that prescribe the medications and coordinates care with other members of the team. Um, they uh, will work absolutely with your uh, physicians, um, plural, and um, allow them to stay involved as involved as they want um, in your care. So, um, you know, recognizing that um, a lot of times you have to advocate for these things um, and know that these are your, you know, that you can do this and, um, and, and ask that they work with your team. So um, the next one down is the hospice nurse. Um, these people are very skilled at working with people who are in um, end stage illness and they are so good at managing pain and symptoms. Um, they uh, they're trained and they will train your family and your caregivers to do these things. Um, they are good listeners. They want to know what you want. They want to know what your goals are. And um, they will try um, very hard to to figure out what it is that you want to do and make that happen for you. Um, it, most family members just find this so invaluable to have somebody that can show them how to do it because, um, you know, that people just feel completely overwhelmed um, with the care of someone at, at end of life. So this is somebody that is a huge resource um, for not only you, but your family. Then there's the CNA is my favorite. Um, these are angels on earth is what I like to call them. Um, they are the ones that will come to your house um, uh, the most often. And they will visit sometimes every day, sometimes every other day. They take care of personal care, um, such as bathing and dressing and mouth care. Some of them will even, you know, like help you get in and out of bed. They'll help set up all of the medical supplies. Um, and they are there to, um, they'll stay sometimes for, you know, an hour or two to allow you to go out to appointments and, and they'll even do like dishes or laundry or help out with whatever you need. Amazing, amazing people. And the, and the CNAs that work with hospice are wonderful, wonderful people. I've met very few that were not just absolute angels. And you have your social worker. Um, your social worker is the one that coordinates all the logistics. Um, they help you work with insurance companies. They help you um, with estate planning. Um, they'll get notaries over um, to notarize wills and power of reserve attorney or anything else you want. They're also um, service counselors. Um, they will talk to you about what your fears are, um, what you'd like to accomplish. Um, they are, um, you know, they will um, put you in touch with um, other organizations that can also help out with things if you need help getting transportation to doctor's appointments or anything. Um, they are just this resource machines that will, um, if they know what you want, they will know where to get it for you. Um, amazing resource. Then there's the hospice chaplains. And um, this was something that I think a lot of people do not know is hospice chaplains are, unless the hospice is like a Catholic hospice or a specific religious organization hospice, they are all non-denominational. Hospice chaplains, even if they are denominational, will usually do whatever you want. I mean, we had a Buddhist um, ceremony where they had to open the windows and shoo the spirit, you know, and play drums out the window and the hospice chaplain did that. They'll do uh, veterans, um, um, you know, uh, rights at the end. Um, they would, even if you're not religious at all, they just sit and talk to you and, and talk about, you know, your existential and spiritual concerns at the end of life. Um, really, really wonderful heart people. Um, and they really want to know what you need from them. So they're not going to come into your room with an agenda. Um, they want to know, how can I support you? And um, most people say, oh, no, 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 you know, I've, I've got my own, but talking to a chaplain and in, in conjunction with um, the social worker um, can sometimes be such a great emotional support. And I know people think of hospice as the, you know, med, meds management and all that, but there's, there's this whole group of people that can all tend to you in various ways. 
And then there's the hospice volunteers. Um, and this is what I've done for a really long time. Um, we are we go to a lot of trainings. Um, we're especially trained in end of life issues. Um, we're also uh, trained as companions so that if the family needs to go to a wedding or take a day off and um, has to leave the person who's in hospice, they can you can get a volunteer to come over to your house and sit with them and watch movies together or go through old photos or listen to music or read. Um, you know, so that is a huge thing is to have. And then also other hospice volunteers will come over and mow your lawn or take your dog for a walk or um, there's volunteers who are notaries. There's volunteers that go shopping and do heart uh, housework. Um, and then um, some of us are trained on comfort touch. Um, so we'll come over and um, if somebody's you know agitated or uncomfortable, comfortable, we'll, we'll do comfort touch on their hands and feet, you know, to kind of calm them down and, and assist in, in some really light, um, comforting. Um, so it's, it's not really massage, it's more like acupressure on your hands and feet. It's really uh, lovely. And so um, the hospice volunteers are another resource you get when you add hospice to your team. And then on the other side, there's bereavement specialists. Um, some hospices um, address anticipatory grief, um, both for yourself and for your caregivers. Um, others, um, it's after um, the patient dies. The families and friends and pretty much anybody who knew the person who died on hospice gets up to 13 months of individual counseling, access to support groups, um, grief education seminars, it is an amazing resource. I when um, I did outreach calls to newly bereaved folks, and um, they were always shocked that they had unlimited counseling for a year for free, um, as part of the hospice. You know, as just part of being one of the hospice families, and so that's a huge resource as well. You know, to have that support um, when the person does go, and a lot of hospices now are are recognizing the importance of anticipatory grief. Um, you know, both for the person who is who is at the end of life and for the families. And there's a 24 hour support line. So not only will you receive regular visits um, at your home as much as you need, um, you know, the nurse might come one or two days a week. The CNA might come every other day or every day if it's necessary. The doctor might show up once every couple of weeks or when something has changed but there's always 24 hour telephone support. So if something's going on in the middle of the night, your family has someone they can call and say, what do I do? Um, and that can really, really feel like an amazing um, support because you know if something's happening, if somebody's in pain, you don't know what to do, you're freaking out and you call the ambulance or 911, then they're required to resuscitate you. And in some cases that is not what you want. So, um, and you, if your fondest wish is not to die in a hospital um, hooked up to tubes, then you don't want to call 911 or an ambulance when you're on hospice. So having that support line that you can call, I mean, and you can call and ask, you know, things like, I can't figure out how to get the bed to, you know, sit up or it's set up and I can't get it to fold down. They'll answer those questions too. So the 24 hour support line is amazing. Or if you have a thing that you need, like, um, you know, we need a, we didn't know this, but we needed support you know, a, a chair for the shower, or then they will um, send somebody over with it. Um, so having that 24-7 support is amazing. And they will come anywhere you are. So if it's your residence, they'll come there. If you live in an assisted living facility, they'll come there. Nursing homes, um, they, um, you get a, a visit on an average five or six times a week. And, you know, that's between the physical, emotional, and spiritual support to monitor pain, manage symptoms. They can help out with nutrition, um, watch for emotional issues. And, you know, just having that, the, the caregivers um, have access to that is, is a really great thing. There's also some hospices, not all, offer inpatient care centers. Um, the one uh, true uh, where I, I volunteer is up uh, at Longmont Community Hospital. This uh, picture here is of Denver Hospice's inpatient care facility, and it is beautiful. And when you go to inpatient care, um, and th this is never mandatory, but um, it has around the clock nursing care, um, state of the art pain management. Um, they have the chaplains that are on staff. Um, 
the volunteers, there's a volunteer on staff the whole time that can just come hang out with you if you need company or do um, um, comfort touch. Um, and so the, the care centers are generally for when people are having breakthrough pain that can't be controlled at home and they, they want to be in a facility where let's get the, this pain under control. Or if you've got wounds um, management that needs, you know, um, drains or something like that. Or if you're starting to have um, delirium or end of life agitation and, um, you know, you're trying to yank out, you know, tubes or or get up and walk around when it's not safe to do so if you're very very nauseous um, or just a, a big decline and your caregivers can't uh, keep up then um, having an inpatient care center is a huge uh, comfort both to the patient and to the caregivers and then also if everybody's just at the end of their rope and um, don't know if they can cope um, then you know you can check into the respite care center just to give your caregivers, uh, you know, a few days of, of break. Or if they have, um, I have one um, hospice patient whose daughter who was taking care of her had to go for knee replacement surgery. And so she went into the care center while her daughter had surgery and then they both kind of came home together. So, and inpatient care centers are one of those things that you can check in and you can check out. If you wanna go in for pain management, but you would rather die at home, they'll say, you know, they'll get an ambulance to take you home. Um, so it's not um, one of those things where if I'm, I'm afraid if I go in, I won't come out because the hospice really tries very hard to make sure that you have the end of life that you want. And so as a recap, I will just go over um, um, 10 of the basic hospice facts. Um, one is hospice is for people with advanced illness. So it is for symptom and pain management, um, serious illness. It doesn't matter how old you are. I mean, unfortunately, I've seen 10 year olds in hospice and I've seen 102 year olds in hospice. Um, it doesn't matter what beliefs you have. Um, we've had, um, you know, all sorts of different uh, cultures, beliefs um, and the cause of illness doesn't matter. Um, you know, it could be anything. Um, even people with uh, late stage Parkinson's and you know chronic illnesses um, are eligible for hospice. So it's pretty much anyone who is within, who a doctor has said is probably within six months. And um, I don't want you to think that that's a hard and fast thing because there are plenty of people that have been on hospice for years. Um, the other one is that hospice can happen anywhere. Um, you know, again, it, it's what it, they come to where you are. And um, if you feel better at home, surrounded by the people and places that you and things that you love, um, they will definitely make that happen for you. And this is the, if you take nothing away from this, I want this to be the, the thing that you take away is that it is your choice always. What treatments you want, what treatments you don't want, what medications you want, what medications you don't want. If you wanna leave hospice and go back to curative care, if you want to come back, um, if you wanna to go to a care center and then you wanna come home, they will do anything they can um, to make it your choice. Um, and as long as you meet the hospice eligibility guidelines, um, and some people go on hospice and then they start to get better and they go off. And then, um, you know, so it, it's entirely up to you. And um, you can keep taking some medications um, that um, as long as they're um, increasing your quality of life. Um, so people always say, oh, I can't take any of my meds um, when I'm on hospice. Yes, you can. You know, if you have mental health um, medications that you want to take, um, and there are some, you know, quality of life comfort care medicines that you can take, and hospice will give you, um, you know, their medications as well to help control your pain. And the, I think probably the number one uh, myth about hospice is that they will, their goal is to over medicate you and, and, and hasten your death. And that is absolutely not the case. Hospice doctors try to give just enough medicine to manage your symptoms and ease pain. And a good hospice will always ask you or tell you and your family beforehand, if we're going to control this pain, we may have to sacrifice some lucidity. Are you ready for that? Or would you rather endure a little more pain in, in service of, of being more lucid. 
And um, so I've had a lot of patients that say, no, 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 I, I can tolerate the pain. I just want to be, you know, I want to be alert and active and, and as, as with it as possible for as long as possible. And then they get to say, okay, I'm ready to sacrifice a little lucidity for comfort because it's the pain's getting to be a little bit too much. So that's always your choice as well. And um, if you feel like you're over medicated, then you can tell them and they'll back it off. And, you know, so they try to get in the sweet spot where you're, you're as lucid as possible and feeling as good as possible. And sometimes that's a moving target. And sometimes at the end, it takes a lot of medication um, to control the pain. Um, so they, that's where that comes from is sometimes the amount of medication that you have to take um, to manage your pain, you do sacrifice some lucidity. And um, be sure and ask that question if they don't volunteer that information, you know, say, I, you know, my goal is to, is to be as with it, you know, and, and as much myself as I can be for as long as possible. And, and, you know, I want to, to just titrate the medicine little by little to make sure that happens. And I will let you know when I'm ready to sacrifice some lucidity and service of comfort. Um, also your family and your caregivers are still your primary caregivers. They are supported and they are trained by your hospice team and they get regular visits from the hospice team to help out, but they're still considered your primary caregivers and what they want. Um, and if they want to speak for you, it's always, um, their call, you know, if you're not able to speak for yourself, then then they are your primary support team and hospice considers themselves a support to your caregivers, not replacing your caregivers. And so, and same thing, if you live in an assisted living facility or a nursing home, uh, the facility staff um, will be your primary care and hospice is their support. And uh, even though you are supposed to have a diagnosis of six months or less to live, um, it can always be extended. Um, like I said, I know people that have been on hospice for years um, and, you know, especially like um, Parkinson's or dementia or um, people who are, you know, like 102 years old. And so the doctor will say, yeah, they're probably within six months <laughs> to the end of their life. And um they live another, they're having their 104th birthday still on hospice. So um, in, in almost every case of families that I've worked with and, and in surveys in general, the overwhelming thing is we wish we would have known about or requested hospice care sooner. Um, so there is no limit. Um, you, you do have to renew it, but insurance really is, is pretty good, um, especially Medicare, Medicaid um, is very good about extending it as long as needed. Also, all the medical equipment that you'll need can be provided by hospice. I mean, they'll put a hospital bed in your living room, you know, or in your kitchen so that you can be down where you want to be. They'll have, bring over all the oxygen tanks and toileting supplies. And they also have a breakthrough pain kit that you keep in your freezer. So if you're at home and it's in the middle of the night and um, you don't want to call 911, they have like an emergency, um, you know, pain breakthrough kit that, that your family can give to you if, if you... Um, so a lot of people worry, you know, um, I always um, hear people say, I'm not afraid of being dead. I'm more afraid of dying. I don't want it to be painful. I don't want it to be undignified. And um, hospice is one of those things that makes it so that that's not the case. Um, you're not going, you know, they try so hard to make sure that you don't suffer and you're not in pain and that your family isn't freaked out and that you don't have to. Um, you know, suffer any of that at the end. And to have all that stuff just brought over, I mean, the resources that you have access to um, in hospice is, is quite incredible. And, um, you know, a, a lot of times people think about hospice being for the patient, but it is really for the family as well. Um, emotional support, spiritual support, having that person that you can call when you don't know what to do, um, and then after the patient dies for more than a year, they still get the support. And so, you know, advice and guidance and even support with stuff like, I don't know how to um, get the car in my name. I don't have to, you know, I don't know. So the social workers will continue to help the family with stuff like that. Um, it's so, um, or, you know, they'll, they'll put you in touch with other community organizations that can help with stuff like that, um, help you get copies of death certificates. I mean, it's just um, a, a, such a well-rounded service. 
And um, then again, you know, the, everybody thinks that it's going to be really expensive. It sounds wonderful, but how can I afford it? And Medicare Part A covers 100% of the cost of hospice um, with no deductible and no co-payment. And most private or employer provided health insurances do cover it as well. Of course, you know, you'd want to check with your insurance company before doing that. But um, Medicaid also provides hospice coverage, but it does vary from state to state. Um, Colorado's is pretty good. So um, uh, be sure and check with you know, your medical insurance company because in most cases, hospice is, is completely covered. So if you're gonna shop for a hospice, um, here are some questions um, that you should ask. Um, not all providers are the same. Some are nonprofit and um, won't take meta, you know, money from you at, at all. Um, so ask them, how are the hospice costs covered? Um, do you accept Medicare? Do you accept Medicaid? Um, do you take VA uh, benefits? And um, which private insurances do you take? Are you a profit or nonprofit? Are you religiously based or non-religiously based? Um, what levels of care are provided? And how often will the care team visit our home? And um, in most cases, this will be um, you know, as often as needed, um, but definitely ask that question, you know, how many people will be on my team? Will I have all of those people that I talked about? Will I have a doctor and a nurse and a chaplain and a social worker and volunteers? Um, then ask what, what are the admissions processes? Um, how quickly can I get in? Um, you know, how long, if, if, if you would like to be in an inpatient facility, how long is the wait? Um, is there a wait? Are there beds available now? Uh, what happens? If there's an emergency or an episode of aggressive systems, that's when you say, you know, do you have a 24 seven support line? Will I be given an emergency uh, breakthrough pain kit um, to keep in my freezer at home? Um, will there be a nurse on call who will come to the house um, if something happens, you know, in the middle of the night? And then how well can they manage complex systems in the house? Um, so like if somebody has um, a wound care that's needed, or if somebody is, um, you know, having terminal agitation, or if they're, you know, um, something like that, can they manage those in the home? Or is there an inpatient option for acute care? And because um, not all hospices will have that inpatient care center, um, they would take you to a hospital. And so, you know, say, you know, if you don't have an inpatient care center, where would I be taken for acute care? And then if, if it's important to you, um, ask about, you know, this is my specific religious or cultural traditions. It's very important to me. Like um, in some traditions, you know, the burial has to happen right away, um, like Jewish traditions. In, in others, um, you can't touch the body until, um, or have anything to do with the body and everybody has to leave the room until the, um, you know, priest, you know, comes to say something. And so, you know, make sure that um, you mention that at the outset and make sure that they can accommodate that for you. And here are a couple of helpful links for you. Um, this first one um, is a um, PDF hospice discussion guide. So it's um, it pretty much says everything I, I have said here tonight. Um, plus it has, you know, a, a, li a list of questions, you know, to ask uh, the hospice um, that you're considering interviewing. And it also um, talks about how to talk to your doctor about it and how to talk to your family about um, your decision to enter hospice. And then the second link here is the National Hospice Locator um, for the state of Colorado. And so that is what lists every single hospice in Colorado with links to their website and it has all their contact information. So um, not just in the Denver metro area, but all over the state. So if you're not here in Colorado and you wanna know what hospices are in your area, and I really would encourage you to, um, if you're um, considering adding hospice to your care team when it's time to kind of suss out, you know, interview a couple and figure out who you're gonna go with um, when it's that time so that you know, it's not a decision that you're trying to scramble for last minute. And that's all I had. So I will stop screen sharing and we can open it up. If anybody has any questions, you can just un, um, unmute and ask away. Well, Haile, I wanna say thank you so much for that. I learned a lot and I've had three parents that went through hospice. So <laughs> I've learned a lot. Um, I, I wondered, if we should have talked about this before. Would you mind if we share this slide deck? Oh, so no, we, yeah. 
great. So they can have that as a resource. So I'll be Mm -hmm. sure that that's sent out to everyone who's registered. So, Mm -hmm. all right, I've got questions, but I'm gonna let other people go first. (laughs) Okay. Was there anything in chat? I noticed that there was. Audrey had mentioned in the chat um, how grateful she was that you said that hospice companies provide different services and it's important to interview the various companies. And I I had planned to ask you a question about how the best way to interview, but you gave us that answer already. Oh, good. Well done, (laughs) you. Headed that off at the pass, so. (laughs) Well, maybe I'll go ahead and ask you a couple of my questions. Um, You know, one of the things that came to me was choosing hospice is very difficult. Um, And so I appreciated so much the interview questions. And so I wanna be sure that people get that um, because I know in my hospice experience that 